Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending the Main Street Now Conference Rewind webinar series. We're here today with Kathleen Edgerly and Kate Litwin, both of Howell Main Street in Michigan. They are 2018 Great American Main Street Award winning community and are going to talk to us about uh, communication in our Main Street programs. We're so thankful that they've agreed to represent this presentation that originally appeared at the 2019 Main Street Now Conference in Seattle. If you weren't able to attend the conference or there was a lot of other stuff going on and you may have missed it, uh, we're happy to be able to present it again today. Uh, if you are uh, logged in on this webinar program, you can use audio in two fashions. You can use either your phone audio uh, by dialing in or you can choose to use your computer audio. If you want to make that switch at any point during the program, you check out the audio panel on your uh, control panel. If you are interested in asking any questions uh, during the presentation today, uh, there is a question function on your control panel and you can type that question in. Uh, I'll read the question out loud to Kathleen and Kate and we can address it. We are gonna do question and answer at the end uh, of the program, uh, but you know, whenever the question comes to you, go ahead and ask it and we'll also prompt you again at the end uh, to get your questions ready so that uh, everybody has an opportunity to, to chat and engage. There's also a handout of this presentation in the handout section of your control panel um, as a PDF. Now, if you're viewing this afterwards, uh, you might not be able to access the PDF here, but you can always check out uh, lots of the presentations from the Main Street Now Conference at the Main Street Now Conference app website. Uh, that's eventmobi MSN 2019. Uh, that's also available through the Main Street website. Uh, you can check out not just this presentation, uh, but several others in um, uh, either PDF or uh, PowerPoint format there. So we encourage you to always do that. Uh, if you have any problems uh, connecting uh, during the day, today's program, you can also go ahead and use the question section to just uh, alert me of that, and I'll see what I can do to help you on this end uh, as well. So we're glad that you're all here. And now I will turn it over uh, to Kathleen. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kelly, and welcome, everybody. We had a blast in Seattle and really enjoyed meeting so many of you when we originally presented um, our Saving Our Cities is Communication, the Key to what, What's Missing, but hope that you all take something away today as well and have so many of you joining us. It's wonderful. But before we get really jumping into the presentation, we'd like to get a feel for who we have on the webinar today, whether you are an elected official, Main Street director, volunteer, other form of city leader, we'd love to have you indicate that on the side uh, panel here on your screen. So go ahead and tell us about yourself. That poll is open. We're gonna leave it open for just a moment here while we collect some responses from the audience. So we'd love to hear from you. And they're rolling in currently. Excellent. All right, well, we haven't gotten everybody yet, but um, we'll go ahead and move forward because it's a pretty clear audience today. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, most of our attendees uh, are Main Street program staff, around 60%. Um, and then we're looking also at a variety of other partners, volunteers, and a few elected officials also on the call today. Excellent. So whether you're representing a Main Street program, a municipality, neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera, when it comes to communicating with your stakeholders and questions about what is Main Street and why does it matter or why do I care, or say you're facing a financial crisis and people are wondering what they need to know about the upcoming millage or bond proposal and why should they care, we, we totally get it. The struggle is real. Uh, you could be very articulate saying all the right things but maybe it's just not coming across i don't know about any of you but sometimes a lot of times actually as we're in different meetings or giving updates and communicating with our different stakeholders i feel like this lady on the screen is talking to a wall and it could be for a variety of reasons uh like i said you could be saying all the right words but nobody's listening they just can't quite see the value of what you're doing. Possibly they're just overburdened already with dwindling budgets or things of that nature, and they just don't get it. 
but communication is essential and it's where so many programs and so many communities start to really break down. We know it's not easy. There's so many different ways to communicate, so many communication methods and tools out there. Plus, um, you know, whether we're talking cities, whether we're talking Main Street, it's easier to talk with those who are already receptive to your message. Maybe they already know who you are or they know the proposal that you're floating out there. They already get who you represent. They get your program. They get your needs and they're willing to listen. Uh, but we all have different audiences too. Local municipalities have, you mis excuse me, municipalities have groups that advocate for them, uh, that lobby for them. There's government speak, et cetera, to really advocate for individual cities or towns. And for Main Street, you're bringing that social capital, the passion and pride and what brings people uh, to want to live in your community, to open a business, play there, et cetera. But we have to start figuring out a way to make these two work together rather than against each other, because that does happen uh, all too often in different communities. And that requires that we really start listening to each other, because if we are going to essentially save our cities and build successful communities, we have to be willing to partner and work together. And this is something I can't stress enough. Uh, knowing what your story is, knowing what your message is, is so vital to your success. And at the end of the day, whether you agree or not, a large part of our job comes down to marketing and PR. Uh, you have to decide that story, tell it loud and proud. It's not easy. Oftentimes it takes you repeating yourself over and over and takes a lot of time. Uh, you might just have to tell your story in different ways, depending on your audience. We'll get to that a little bit later. It's about changing mindsets, perceptions, the ways that things are getting done. Because to make your town vibrant, successful, and better for years to come, sometimes that requires changing the status quo. And some of you might be wondering, how exactly do you do this? I I'm here to tell you there's no silver bullet. Each community each situation is very, very different. So you have to be able to navigate that. And with experience that I have in marketing and PR training, um, it comes down to these four main areas. Knowing your audience. Who exactly are you talking to? And you may have a variety of audiences. So what communication style reaches those audiences? Whether it is email, face-to-face um, -face communication, picking up the phone, newsletters, et cetera. I know in our world in Main Street and working in downtown, this can be true from one business to the next in a block, let alone when you're talking businesses, residents, city leaders, donors, et cetera. And learning how to communicate your message in 30 seconds or less. What are you saying? Why should people care? And what does it mean to them? Or flipping that, what does it mean to me? And then of course, leveraging your partnerships, getting other people to tell your story. And I'm not necessarily saying tell it for you, because if you're really good and have a strongly developed story, um, people are willing to tell it with you and become your advocates. And it comes so much, sometimes so much clearer or stronger when you have somebody else saying it instead of if you're known as the face of downtown or the face of your city, things of that nature, having somebody else tell your story can carry a lot more weight with their friends and other partners out there as well. So we're going to start breaking this down um, when we talk about knowing your audience. One of the first audiences from a uh, Main Street perspective, we talk about talking to your city councils. Uh, and when speaking to your council, there are a couple different scenarios that you should definitely keep in mind. How you communicate your value at a council meeting could be and it definitely, definitely should be different than if you were meeting one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're getting up in front of council, say, um, and you're talking about all the effort that you're doing, the different programming happening, et cetera, a lot of times they're looking for data-driven, uh, results-oriented information, focusing a lot on economic development, the overall impact on their constituents, and then you have your communication when you're just speaking one-on-one -on -one with a council member or maybe a couple council members. It's all about trust and developing a relationship. And so often uh, when I talk about this, people will push back. Well, I can't 
become friends with my council members. You know, we need to have that separation, et cetera. And I get that. I'm not asking you to go on vacation with them, have them join your book club, go fishing, et cetera. It's more about developing a level of respect, a level of trust, and definitely that professional rapport. So when things get difficult or you have a need, you have that trust and that relationship already established where you can go to them and say, hey, I need this. or I'm about to present on this program or activity we're rolling out and I have these gaps. And you can have that more comfortable conversation and relationship existing. Or vice versa, they can come to you and say, I'm not getting this at all, but I trust that there is a plan or you have the answer, so explain it to me a little bit more. Again, it can take time, but definitely I encourage everybody to make the time. And if it requires doing things over and over, it takes you know, months or a year to establish these relationships, that's okay. Keep at it. It will totally pay off in the end, and it's definitely worth it. So here in Howell, with our program, um, through the years, we've developed a very strong relationship with uh, our council and our council members. But we also have recently had some challenges with council turnover, budget cuts, as I'm sure many of you have experienced as well, et cetera. And while we had a good relationship, and even some council members who had been part of our board of directors before or who had volunteered with our program before they were elected to council, we could see that there was a shift happening community-wide as well as on council. And we knew we were going to have to dig in a little bit deeper in terms of education and overall developing a rapport with council members, especially the new ones, while also setting up a strategy for our longtime council members. And we set this up in what we call a five-step program. So it starts, of course, with knowing our face and introducing ourselves, who we are, what we represent. So say somebody just got elected on council, you are there at the council meeting. All it takes is something as simple as walking up, sticking out your hand. Hi, I'm Kathleen Edgerly. I represent the Main Street Program and our Downtown Development Authority. Congratulations on your new council seat. I'd love to set up a time with you to have coffee and just kind of share what we have coming up over the next year and would love to answer any questions that you have. Again, very simple, only takes a couple of minutes. If you're not at that council meeting, um, reach out to them afterwards. Or if you're representing a city and you need to have a relationship with your Main Street uh, program so that they know what your long-term vision plans are and how the downtown fits into that, just reverse that type of relationship. And then step two, tell the story about the programs and services and that overall benefit. And don't just do it during budget season. You're doing this properly. You've already laid the groundwork. You, they understand, again, your fundamental programming, what you do throughout the year, who all is involved, and what your needs are. And it might, you know, um, even include some of those side conversations as well when you're introducing yourself, coffee, things of that nature, and telling it over and over and over again. Step three, set your ego aside. It goes back to where we started here about the partnerships and having to work together. Give your council members the glory. How hard is it to say, hey, would you mind emceeing our awards night or introducing a band at this summer festival, things of that nature? Um, it starts developing a great experience. And so they're associating your program and your projects in a very positive way. Plus, instead of sitting in front of a room full of people who are mad at them for decisions that have been made, or maybe not mad, but just questioning um, decisions that were made, budget cuts, et cetera. This is where your council members can have a very positive experience with the residents that they serve, with the business owners that exist in their district, and the list goes on and on. Then that's going to help them want to be even more personally involved. And hey, volunteering. You might have yourself a new volunteer here for the long haul, not just once or twice whenever you invite them, they might actually be willing to volunteer on their own. And now some of your maybe biggest naysayers or questioners have become your biggest advocates. And there is that more deep-seated understanding. And as we continue to break this down, I'm going to pass this off to Kate now um, to talk about businesses and donor relationships. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. When we talk about your audience, business and donors, we kind of lump them together because they're very similar. Um, but the biggest thing that we need to keep in mind with our businesses and our donors is that it's critical to 
establish these relationships before you even ask for anything. Um, it's nobody wants to have somebody walk into their store or walk into their office for the very first time and say, "Hey, this is who I am. Give me ten thousand um, dollars." You you really need to establish those relationships and get to know your businesses, get to know your donors before you even make that ask. So if you're a newer director, it's actually, it might be a little bit easier for you. You want to take take a few days, get out of the office, go around and introduce yourself, explain who you are, put that face to a name so that they know who you are and who you represent. If you've been around for a little bit longer and you still need to establish a relationship, it's kind of the same thing. You want to get out there. Just go out there and maybe reintroduce yourself. Just wander around. Um, Take time to visit can I interject after. for a moment? Yes. Sorry. Uh, I, this can be true, too, to uh, pe people who are maybe running for a council seat or some other elected position, getting out and developing that relationship already and getting them to know your face. Absolutely. Um, you know, some things that we do here at Hall Main Street, we will take the time to visit our businesses after, like I said, Small Business Saturday or another major event that happens downtown just to see how sales were, get that feedback. How was that event for them? We will walk around the district and we'll hand deliver our newsletters that go out to all of our merchants. We're swinging in, we're stopping by, we're making sure that they see our faces on a regular basis. Um, a hand delivered thank you note can go a long way as well. And you know, if you're out and about in your community, even if you're not working, I know that I work in, live in the same community. I work here in Howell and I live here in Howell. Um, when I see people, I, I, I always say hi and I remind them who I am. I'm a resident, but I'm also, you know, an advocate for your business, for your, um, for your donors. And then don't also, also don't forget to say thank you for making that investment in your community because they are driving your economy and it's really important that they are appreciated and feel appreciated on a regular basis. But, you know, before you walk out the door, you want to make sure that you have what I call the um, elevator speech. You want to have your elevator speech ready because you need to be able to deliver that message concisely, briefly, in that 30 seconds-ish that it roughly takes people to ride from the bottom to the top of the elevator, top of a building in the elevator. And it's really important that you have this established and possibly even completely memorized before you walk out the door. It really goes a long way and helps you. In order to write the speech, and when you're trying to communicate the value of your organization, you need to keep in mind that people really only want to know basically three things. Um, you know, the first one is what does that audience, what does that donor, what does that business need to know about your organization? So this is answering the questions like who are you and why do you exist? For Main Street, it's really important that you stress that you are volunteer-led. I mean, let's face it, most of us have one or two staff people and then the rest of this really important work that we do is completely done by volunteers. It's really important information to get out there. You might be a nonprofit. You exist to build your community to increase economic development and essentially make your community thrive. Then you need to make sure that you drive home what makes your organization stand out. So you're going to want to mention major projects that they might recognize. Initiatives like facade incentive grants that you offer. Basically, anything to make this memorable because your audience probably isn't taking notes because you're supposed to be in the elevator. So hours after the conversation, you want your audience to, to think to themselves, oh yeah, I remember I met Kate today. I met Kate from Hell Main Street and that's the organization that's responsible for putting all of the art on our walls downtown. That's a really cool project. I think I might want to be involved in that. And then also, what's in it for them or the whistle factor. And this is where you're going to have a variation. You'll have variations on this elevator speech for your audience. And you're gonna to need to improvise depending on who you're talking to. Because you are you seeking sponsorship? Then you're gonna to wanna to talk about the marketing opportunities and their visibility at your events, et cetera. Um, are you looking for donations? You'll wanna discuss your funding structure that possibly how you're accomplishing so much in your organization with so few resources. So it's always best to prepare a few scenarios ahead of time and kind of have those in the back of your mind and know which direction you're going to go in, depending on who's in the elevator with you. And definitely want to ask for a business card. And you want to be able to ask that person 
can I have your contact information? Do you have a card so that I can follow up with you? And maybe we can go out for coffee or, or have another meeting to discuss things further. There's nothing worse than fumbling. So make sure that you have the business card in your pocket and ready to go as well so that if they're interested, they can also follow up with you. You gotta make sure that you have that communication two-way street going as well. Now, when we talk about volunteers, I mean, most of our time with Main Street deals with communicating with volunteers. And like this lovely picture, you wanna establish a long-term relationship and communication is really key to any successful relationship. So it's like a courting process, a dating process. Um, here at How Main Street, what I do, and a major part of my job is I go on a lot of dates. We call them first dates, and they're that initial meeting with an interested volunteer. I may get a name from another volunteer and say, hey, reach out to this person, or they might fill out a volunteer form on our website. So I'll typically take someone out for coffee or adult beverage if they're interested in the brewery or the winery. I try to keep it really casual and comfortable, and because Typically, the more comfortable people are, the more they like to talk about themselves, and that's really what you want them to do. You want to start talking about that volunteer. Get to know their interests. What type of volunteering have they done in the past? What have they enjoyed? Um, sometimes it's also even good to ask them what they haven't liked, so that way you can tailor these roles to whatever they're interested in. I also try to go in without any assumptions. If I know that for example, the volunteer I'm gonna meet with is a graphic designer, I don't always assume that that's the type of volunteer work that they wanna do. Sometimes they like to stay in their wheelhouse and maybe they will be excellent at designing you a new logo or posters. Sometimes they don't wanna do their day job when they're volunteering. So they might wanna try something different. So exploring all of those possibilities are really important there. And that elevator speech comes in handy here too, because you want to pitch your organization and you want to create that excitement. The projects, the committees, and all of those options that exist for volunteering. Hopefully, if you land a second date, like your volunteer comes back and they really want to get involved, you're gonna ignite that passion, that pride for the community and project as a whole. Sometimes that even means taking one for the team. I know that uh, Kathleen and I, we typically try to take on some of those tasks like emptying garbage bins because most of the time people don't want to do that as a volunteer. They want to, they want to do the fun stuff. So let's let them sell the beer tickets. Let's let them interact with our community. We'll take care of some of those, you know, those other tasks. But if your volunteers engaged and they're having fun and they're having a good time, hopefully they will become some of the strongest advocates that your organization can ever have. Because they're gonna be interacting with the public and they're gonna communicate how valuable Main Street is to your community. So sometimes as staff, I know Kathleen just mentioned this just a few minutes ago, it feels like we're talking to the wall. So that message, that advocacy of what is Main Street and what is this organization doing and you're having so much fun, the volunteer can explain all of that in a way that clicks with another prospective volunteer. Maybe it's a donor, maybe it's a city official. So then let's say that you get engaged. Dating goes really well. You've got a bunch of dates, your relationship is blossoming, and you've got, you've got someone that's really committed. You wanna keep them engaged and keep that com communication, that relationship thriving. So some good tips are like just mentioning them on social media. We will mention every month our volunteer of the month. We put up pictures of people having fun, volunteering. We'll do project team highlights. Um, even just pictures of volunteer work in action go a long way. People wanna see the fruits of their labor. We also have recently created a volunteer appreciation program that is geared toward our committed volunteers so that at the end of the year when all of our big projects are said and done, we're gonna have one heck of a party to celebrate volunteerism and only those people who have volunteered with us during the year will be invited to this big old party. It celebrates all of the hard work that they do each and every day. Just a, another way for us to be able to give back to our volunteers. We also do an uh, annual appreciation applause award. So that's a, where we recognize our volunteer of the year and we give out some other volunteer awards. But that volunteer appreciation program and that party that we're gonna have, that's just for fun. Next, your residents. Sometimes residents in your district 
might not see the value that Main Street is bringing to the community. Um, you know, we have we definitely have them here in hell. Maybe they're afraid of the changes. They see all these new projects and they see all these new things happening, or they're unsure of the organization. Sometimes they think get you confused with other organizations. I know that happens to us a lot. Um, maybe they're just the cave people, those citizens against virtually everything. Um, my example on this is the first time that we ever did a food truck rally was in November of 2015. So we're in Michigan doing a food truck rally in November in Michigan is ambitious to say the least. Um, what we found was that there were people coming out because they didn't understand the food truck process. They didn't understand what in the world we were trying to do. And there were the cave people were coming out to try to watch us fail. We didn't fail. We had over a thousand people. It was an amazing event, but they came out and they saw that and they saw the excitement and it started to turn. We get really excited when our residents start to participate in all of the fun things that we do, but sometimes we have to bring downtown to them. Sometimes we have to, we do things like we deliver copies of our newsletters directly to them. We have printed copies, we take it to them. We might stick uh, postcards in all of the, we have a lot of loft apartments and some downtown living stick postcards and invitations into their mailboxes to make sure that they know something is coming. We even will give them small tokens of appreciation, like a voucher to our food truck rally. Come down, come experience this with us. Let us show you all of the good things that are happening downtown, getting them on board with our projects and events, and also hopefully reminding them that a thriving community benefits all of us. It benefits not only the well-being and, you know, livelihood of all of the residents and all of the businesses and everything economically that's flourishing, but also helps improve their property value as well. And it makes downtown where they live the place to be. Now here, reaching your audience, it, it can be challenging and face-to-face -face interaction just isn't possible or realistic with everybody. So what you need to do is create a comprehensive communication strategy that includes all of these elements. Um, you know, we've got a whole list here from face-to-face -face interactions to phone calls. It's really important to reach out to donors and sponsors just to say thank you, maybe give a project update, ask them to be an advocate for your organization. Is there something that they could be an influencer? They could call the right people and talk to the right people to help facilitate a project or a plan that you have going on. Print media, um, I can't stress enough the importance of a well-crafted press release. It's vital to getting project coverage without draining your marketing budget. So learning how to craft a good press release or recruit a volunteer with this experience is really helpful. Um, your online and social media are exceptionally important as well. Pretty well-versed there, but how often do you really look at your website? Recently, we had our promo committee do a website review because we wanted to make sure that what was on our website is the story that we want to tell. And we wanna make sure that that's the one that is being conveyed, that our audience is actually reading. Social media, it kind of goes along in the same regard. You wanna make sure that your audience is receiving your message, but also realizing that different platforms have different audiences. Your audience for Facebook typically isn't your same audience for Instagram or Snapchat. There's wide demographics there. So using all of those analytic tools that you are probably provided with, I know through Facebook you've got analytics and Twitter as well, you wanna make sure that you're using those so that you understand your audience and what their needs are. Um, a lot of us are really good as organizations at you know, stating the simple stuff like company X, Y, or Z is having a sale, but how many of us are really good about tooting our own horns and bragging a little bit? You wanna share your story, use your social media platform to, to tout your events, to tout the economic development, every good project or program that you guys are doing, no matter how much it seems like that's just your day-to-day -day operations, like this is just what we do, let the public know. It's really important to get it out there. Other really valuable tools are newsletters and annual reports and surveys to get, to get everybody's feedback as well. So now that you've cultivated these relationships, 
it's time to put them to work and to, to leverage them for you. Now you've got a whole bunch of new advocates for your organization and they're telling your story for you. And encouraging your committee members and your board members and your city council members, everybody that you're organ you know, involved with, ask them to make sure to tag you on social media. Share their stories about volunteering or participating with projects or awards that they may have won. Make sure that you're hitting your audience and their audience. It's going to double your marketing efforts without creating much extra work for you at all. And it's amazing how that exposure can grow exponentially the more people that you reach. And then you want to make sure that you're truly partnering on projects. And this is really important that you're partnering with other organizations within your own community just to make sure that these relationships are mutually beneficial and that everybody is working together. Um, we recently established very, we have very good relationship with our Chamber of Commerce here in Howell, and we also have a great relationship with a local credit union. And we were looking at ways to help enhance our downtown business mix and encourage small businesses to grow and thrive within our community. And through these relationships, it led to a rental assistance subsidy program, which we can give you more information about that if anybody's interested, that you can always email Kathleen or myself for more information. Um, but we worked with the credit union and the chamber to try to come up with a program to provide a little bit of rental assistance to fledgling brand new small businesses in our downtown that fit the right mix. So we're looking for retail dining or quality entertainment and arts establishments. Um, we have a, you know, our business mix is very healthy here in Howell, and we only, we have a very low vacancy rate, but we still want to make sure that we are providing the mix that our residents and visitors have indicated that they want to see. So we decided to go in that direction. And those relationships, we were able to, to go and talk to Lake Trust, that's the credit union, and talk to them and say, hey, this is something that we feel is really important. Would you like to partner on this project? And they were so excited because they want to get involved in the community and they love to support small businesses. So the, the, this relationship that we established a very long time ago, and maybe over a year or two ago, slowly grew into this relationship where we could walk in and say, we've got this great idea. We just, we really need some help. Our budget is small. How can we make this work? And they were able to give us enough assistance to provide about eight to $10,000 worth of rental assistance to small businesses in our downtown, which has been really exciting. But beyond that, beyond that financial compensation, we're also seeing that because we have these relationships and partnerships, their credit union employees are coming to our events because they want to be there. They're seeing all the really cool, fun things that we do and are having an absolute blast volunteering and getting involved. They're some of the first ones to ever sign up to volunteer whenever we send out a request and send out the SOS saying we need some help. They're there. And that partnership just continues to grow to the point where they want to take this example and model it for our entire state. And it's just a, a great case study in starting small, working your way up, and making sure that you have this mutually beneficial relationship along the way. So I only have a couple more slides to go. So if you guys want to kind of start thinking about any questions that you might have and, and jotting them down or using the question feature to send them over to Kelly, um, I'm going to wrap up and, and then we can field some questions here. Um, at the, the end of the day, communication is just as much about what you say as much as what you don't say. So presenting yourself professionally and being present is going to go a long way in establishing and maintaining those relationships. So you want to make sure that in your face-to-face -face meetings, whether they're one-on-one -on -one or they are group meetings, it's really important to make your audience feel like they're the most important thing that you have to do at that moment. Set those distractions aside, anything that's going on in the back of your mind, whether that's you know, I need to recruit all these volunteers or my kid needs to get picked up from school early, whatever that is, throw that to the back of your mind. Make sure that you're just in the moment. Eye contact, I mean, obviously that's really important. You don't want to make that awkward, but you want to make sure that you're engaging with your audience and keeping that eye contact, not yawning and making sure that you're not, you know, staring at the wall, 
you know, give them that proper eye contact, make sure that they feel like they're the most important person in the room. Um, dress to impress, this is, goes without saying. Unfortunately, we've seen at times, there are some individuals who may show up for a really important meeting. Let's say it's a city council meeting. Not the most professionally. That We've seen people show up in a hoodie and pigtails and cut off shorts. And that's not necessarily the image that you want to convey when you're speaking with your elected officials. So it's really important to make sure that that professionalism is maintained at all times. You want to make sure that you make your mark. Find your power outfit, you know, the one that makes you feel really confident that you're not tugging on and making sure that everything's covered and you got to find that power outfit. Find that one that makes you feel like you could rule the world and make sure that that is your outfit for those meetings. And then last but not least, putting away the phone. I mean, I can only imagine, you know, you're in a webinar right now, you've probably looked at your phone about 18 times, they're there, and it's really easy to pick it up, take a look at it, want to quickly respond to a text or an email, but put it away. Just not face up, face down on the table where it's going to vibrate or do its thing. Literally put it away. If it's at the bottom of your purse or in your coat pocket, you're probably not going to be tempted to check it. And that way, there's no other distraction to keeping that person from feeling like they are the most important person that you have to talk to at this time. You just want to eliminate that distraction. Practicing active listening and responding. This is really important because I feel like too often as individuals, we try to anticipate what our audience is going to say and craft a response without actually listening to what the other person is saying. We're already anticipating, we're already thinking three sentences ahead, and this can lead to some miscommunication and some disjointed conversations where both of you kind of walk away like, well, I don't know, what really just happened there? So try to relax and have a natural discussion, a natural conversation. Really listen to what the other person is saying and give yourself that second or two before responding. It's, it's okay to take that that moment and, and craft your response and make sure that what you're saying is really in response to what your audience just said to you. And then always jumping at the chance to advocate for your organization. Um, a lot, there's oftentimes that you find out about a meeting after the fact or you find out that a meeting is going to happen maybe in two hours. It's okay to say to an organizer, I think it's valuable for Main Street to have a role in this meeting or have a role in a project because we're let's say working with a small business in our district every day so I need to be involved in that can I you know don't, don't be afraid to invite yourself to the meeting you might get turned down it's possible but advocating for your participation and your role within the community is really vital so just making sure that if you think that you should have a role at that meeting you probably should so it's really a, a good strategy to practice very nicely inviting yourself to things. And then lastly, business cards. You just never know when you're going to need one. So like I said before, make sure that you have a couple on you all the time before every single meeting, slip one in your pocket every morning as if it's your car keys or your phone. Um, I even keep, I have a little phone wallet and I keep cards in there because I know I always have my phone. I don't always have you know, my purse with me, but I always have my phone. So there's a couple of cards just slid right down in there and they're ready to go at any time. So that kind of wraps us up. We've got about five minutes left. Kelly, I think we could take some some questions and maybe go over anything that people want to cover. Yeah, if anybody out there has a question you'd like to chat in, you go ahead and use the question function on your screen to chat. Uh, and I'll read the question out loud for you. Uh, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, I just wanted to follow up some, on something that Kate said earlier uh, when you were talking about the ways that you engage residents. I'm just particularly interested in kind of the incentives um, to come to events downtown. Um, how are you measuring the effectiveness? What is that costing you as an organization to kind of provide some sort of voucher? It really depends on the event. Sometimes we were, you know, there are some events that we run that are completely free, so those are more difficult to, to get the metrics on. But for example, when we did a food truck rally, I each voucher is typically worth $5. So what would happen is 
we give them out to the residents. They can come and use them at any of the food trucks. The food trucks take them as cash and then they bring them back to us. What the residents don't know is that we have, I have also stuck a code and a label on there for each person so that I can see who is returning them, who's coming to the events and kind of target it that way. Um, I want to say our cost on our most recent food truck rally might have been a hundred dollars, but it's a really good investment because we want to make sure that our, our residents are buying into the fun things that we are doing downtown. So they've been able to come out, they got some free food, they can experience, we also have beer and wine, we can't give away alcohol, but I wish we could. Um, and they can experience all of that fun. And the residents that we've actually been able to talk to who have said that they used them and that they were at the rally for the first time typically have really positive feedback. They don't realize what the, what they've been missing. And so, you know, for $100, it's a, it's a very valuable marketing technique. Yeah, totally. Uh, just wondering also, how are you all at how in, involving kind of your board in kind of also kind of continuing this message in, in their communications, whether it's your elevator pitch or, you know, uh, kind of making sure that they are also representing the organization as active listeners? <laughs> um, a lot of times we tell our board that they are an extension of staff. So we work through a lot of this with them. We, we've we asked them to make sure that they have their elevator speech ready to go. Um, Kathleen, I mean, if you want to, if you have any other concrete examples here, go ahead. Um, um, we ask them to go ahead and be in some ways a block captain. So if there's key information mm -hmm. we need to communicate with different businesses in our block or we need to survey them about parking or anything of that nature, they can go out and take different sections of the downtown and are prepared for any issues that we think might arise um, and setting them up with all the tools for a successful conversation and dialogue, but then also letting them know it's okay if they don't have all the answers, they need to bring something back to us. Or, you know, when it's going to city council, it's not always myself or Kay as staff giving the updates, but quarterly having a different board member going and giving that kind of update and developing that relationship too with council or going to some of our partner organization events and representing our organization. Uh, those are just a few examples. Oh, thanks guys. Well, one more question on my end. If anybody else has a question, feel free to chat it in. But I'm also wondering broadly, um, are, are you guys using any evalu evaluative tools to kind of measure um, the, the impact of your kind of pitches and, you know, the uh, kind of tone of your messages uh, externally or to volunteers, et cetera? Um, you know, for some of it, it, so much of it comes down to relationships and knowing that it's a comfortable enough relationship where you can go up to somebody and, again, with counsel, for instance, we have this need or we have this gap or, hey, this new idea is coming up. We want to we want to share that with you and make sure you're prepared or bringing people to the table to brainstorm like development opportunities in the downtown or as you go through different studies and processes, how many survey responses you get, things of that nature. Um, for volunteers, it's if they're coming back, if they're participating more than just once, uh, things of that nature. And we do have our volunteer appreciation program that, and those punch cards that can help monitor that in some way. We do at our events have a couple of volunteers stationed at the exit to just check off if they're from the area, uh, if they're a visitor, if they just came for this event or they're coming for something else. Um, if this was their first time, quick, simple questions to provide some of that feedback. And then, of course, social media is always a lot easier to measure in terms of the metrics that are now provided there. Absolutely. And then every month we analyze with our organization committee um, how we're doing with those social media analytics. And we send out a monthly e-newsletter to anyone who wants to subscribe. And we can digest a lot of that data to see what our audience is interested in. Are they are they more interested in events 
or are they more interested in shopping? You know, we can go back and see what, what have they clicked on? What are they engaging with, et cetera? And then we can tailor our newsletters and our messaging, all of that to that audience next month. So it's always changing a little bit. And there's always something different happening downtown. But once you determine, are able to more adequately determine what that audience is interested in, it makes sure you're, you're, you're going to be more effective at delivering that message. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, both of you. This has been an excellent presentation to help get us engaged around the needs of the communities to understand what we're doing and how we do it. Uh, if anybody has follow-up questions um, after the program ends, uh, feel free to reach out to us at Main Street and we can help you get connected. Um, Kate and Kathleen, any other words, uh, last words for our audience? Uh, you know, just going back to that partnership discussion, uh, especially when it comes to some of our elected officials and the Main Street program, there's a, just a variety of ways that Together, we can leverage each other's resources and leverage each other's uh, just messages, tools, things of that nature. I know over the past year, as our city faced a lot of budget shortfalls and talked about um, upcoming Headley overrides or public safety assessments, things of that nature, they came to us because they saw that we had that engagement. A lot of that social capital could fill the room with people if they wanted to really be engaged in shaping the vision for their community, but also for our communication expertise in terms of taking some of that government speak out of it and really effectively breaking that down into those three questions. What is the message? What does it mean to them and why should they care? So that was a that was a great opportunity for us to work hand in hand to really help build our community. Wonderful. And just to note that there's uh, some messages of thanks coming in from uh, members uh, in the audience. So uh, we're all gr glad uh, that you could be here with us today, and uh, thank you to everybody who also tuned in uh, to yeah. participate together. <laughs> and uh, if you enjoyed this, we are there are two more presentations left in this Conference Rewind webinar series. You can find more information about both of those programs at our website, MainStreet.org. And uh, once again, I just want to say a big thank you to Kathleen and Kate. Thank you. Have a great Thank day, everybody. Thank you. We really appreciate this. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Have a great day.